Well, good afternoon. Welcome and thanks for joining us this afternoon for the kickoff uh, session of our Refocus and Rebuild series focused on IT and technology. My name is Sandy Ratliff. I'm with Virginia Community Capital and we are happy to be partnering with the Southwest Virginia Small Business Development Center Network, UVA's College of Wise Ec Office of Economic Development and Agus IT to present this bi-weekly series um, for businesses and organizations covering topics that we all face on a daily basis. Before I introduce my co-host, I want to share a couple housekeeping things. First of all, this session is being recorded for education and training purposes, uh, and it will be made available up on the Virginia Community Capital's Facebook and YouTube channels and also on the Small Business Development Center Network. Um, also, we have muted everyone in an effort to keep the webinar flowing. However, if you have a question for our presenter today, please do not hesitate to put that in our Q&A section and we will address those during and, and after uh, Jonathan's presentation. I would like to turn it over now to Mandy Archer with the Blue Ridge Crossroads Small Business Development Center who will be hosting and moderating today. Mandy, thank you. Thanks, Sandy. It's great to have everyone here. Um, again, you know, as Sandy iterated, we are have everyone in mute, but please be sure to put your questions in the chat box and we will read those at the end. So I do want to give just a quick introduction of our speaker today who has partnered with us on a multitude of the topics for this series. And as you can see while he's pulling it up, it's uh, today's topic is technology roadmap for a growing company. Um, of course, I think technology roadmap is probably in use for any type of company. But uh, Jonathan Evident, he is president and founder of Aegis IT, which is located in Kingsport, Tennessee. Uh, Jonathan has been full time in the IT industry since 2004, but he did start this company in 2012. Um, he does tell us that in the rare moments that he's not in front of a computer, he really likes board games and watching Netflix with both his wife and son. So, Jonathan, we appreciate everything you put in. We are so happy to have you today, and we'll turn it over and let you get to the good stuff. Excellent. Thank you. I will be focusing on speaking into my microphone, so hopefully that won't affect things too much. But hi, I'm Jonathan Evenden with Aegis IT. We provide quality IT consulting and business solutions found personal character and integrity. I'm extremely excited to be doing this series of talks. Uh, there's gonna be seven more that I'm doing and three more that are either my clients or vendors that I use and that we work with very, very closely. So today's, the kickoff presentation is gonna be technology roadmap for a growing company. We're gonna talk about growth at several different levels, focusing mostly on technology, especially how to grow your technology infrastructure and things to watch for and common pitfalls to follow uh, that, that we see clients fall into. So we'll focus on going from super small, whether you're a one man shop or, you know, you got a couple of people and a friend that, that decided to start the company, or if you're going from 50 to hundred people, there's, there's various challenges and problems that each of those different sizes will encounter. And I want to talk about different things to watch for overall. So real quick, about me, uh, I have been fixing computers since the mid nineties. It's a passion, it's a hobby, and I get paid for it. So it's a great combination and I love it. Started doing basically enterprise IT, and I say enterprise IT, meaning working for a company, getting paid to, to manage business systems back in 2005. Um, I, I was doing it in 2004, but that was more on a personal residential level. And I've started Aegis IT in 2012. Uh, we'll just say I was given the opportunity to become an entrepreneur by my previous employer. No hard feelings and I'm extremely thankful for it and, and I'm glad that things have worked out this way. Aegis IT, we do both hardware and software support. We sell hardware, we sell software, we support hardware, we support software primarily on the commercial level. Uh, we provide managed IT services, meaning we provide remote access, antivirus, backups, and anything involving IT. And we spend a lot of time doing disaster recovery and prevention, which we also hit on uh, in the talk today. And I believe that we have at least one talk scheduled solely on this, on this topic in the future because of how important it is. And a uh, big thing that we've been doing lately is hosted phone systems. The demand has surged because of COVID. People want to be able to access their business phone systems from home and outside the office. And so that's, that's been a huge growing section that we've been working with in the past year or so. 
So let's talk about growing a company. So growth is actually a very scary thing. It can be a great thing and it can be an unmanageable thing. I've seen companies where growth has managed to kill the company. Uh, people who don't manage their growth well, they can either be spending money that they don't know about. They can be hiring the wrong people because they need to throw bodies at a position or a problem. And then you end up with somebody who can't handle the job or can't do it well. So size does matter. You've got some common points of pain. Communications is huge. Emails and phones can be a big problem. For example, if you start as one person, maybe you've given out your cell phone as a business owner. And that's great for when it's one person that might work when you have one or two people it might work if you have three or four people, but you start adding more people and your cell phone is going to either be constantly unavailable. Your voicemails will be full and your cell phone doesn't scale to include more employees. So at the very small level, phones becomes a serious problem. Uh, and I'll talk about how communications can be a problem when you're going from say 30 to 60 employees or something along those lines because there are ways that you can make that, make that extremely difficult for yourself as well. You might start a single cell phone, you might transition to multiple locations. If you're a company that has 25 people in an office and you're ready to start a satellite office, how will you handle your email? How will you handle your phones? The traditional on-site phone system does not grow well to multiple locations. That's partly why we've had so much demand for hosted phone systems because we can tie in multiple locations in a very easy manner and it's seamless to the end users and it's seamless to your clients and vendors. A line of business applications. So how are you managing your accounting? How are you managing your sales? Do you have industry specific software? Once again, if you've got a handful of people, this might look very different than if you've got a hundred people. We have clients that they only need a single person in QuickBooks, for example, and we've got clients that need 30 people in QuickBooks, for example. They have very different setups because the needs are different, the server sizes are different, the high availability is different, and you've got a considerable difference in how much those clients are spending to make sure that those applications work properly. Do you have people that need to work remotely versus are they in the office only? That's a huge question with line of business applications that becomes a bigger deal as you grow, and especially right now with COVID, re working remotely. We've, we've never had this many people try to work remotely in the past. Do you have multiple people that need to access it versus just a single person? And do you have issues with permissions? Do you have certain people that need to see certain sections of your accounting system? Do you have people that need to have access to certain accounts within your sales software? Do you have people that need to have access to your line of business application or your CRM or something along those lines? Because the permissions when you're, you got only a few people doesn't necessarily matter as much, but when you've got a hundred people, you got 200 people, it becomes a very serious consideration because you do not want someone uh, that's handling say support to necessarily see some of the sales data and vice versa. And then finally, hardware and software management. Uh, if you, are growing rapidly and you're basically buying up every computer you can find. How do you know what you've deployed? How do you know what's in inventory? How do you know what's in the field? How do you know what user has been assigned to what computer? How do you know how many licenses you have in use? How many, know, how many, how do you know how many licenses you've purchased versus are being used? How do you know if you are over how many licenses you've used? That becomes a pretty serious problem. The more you grow, how do you keep track of what equipment and software needs to be upgraded versus how long it can last in the field? So let's talk about communications and phones. This has been, like I said, a very, uh, very high demand for reviewing this at existing clients. So traditionally, you've got, uh, I mean, there's a long history of phones being the primary form of communication. There's other, uh, there's other means now. Text messaging is a big deal. We have clients that interact heavily with Facebook. We have clients that interact with other, other methods of communication, but we still have phones as the primary, primary method of dealing with clients. In fact, we're still at the point where I've got vendors where all they do is either email support or you have to go on site to submit a form online. And I do not like doing that. I like to be able to pick up the phone and call somebody. And even if I have to work a phone tree for a bit, the fact that I can talk to somebody makes it a whole lot better versus if I'm just filling out a form and an email and, and doing a support ticket. So phones are still 
king when it comes to communication for businesses. And especially here locally, where we've got a, a smaller environment as opposed to say New York City, Los Angeles, Dallas, or a large metro area, uh, I still find an overwhelming desire for client or that clients have an overwhelming desire to be able to pick up the phone and call somebody. So that becomes a business critical platform at this point. You have a growing acceptance for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, other platforms, but uh, you still got phones as king. We, we, we occasionally get support requests through Facebook. We'll occasionally have someone tag us as a, oh, my computer's not working kind of situation, but our primary support is not coming from Facebook or other platforms. It's primarily um, people call us up. We do a lot of support over the phone. Uh, we still, we, we will talk with clients and talk them through issues or, or work with them and remotely connect to their computers, but we're still spending considerable amount of time on the phone, uh, even though we're a technology company and even though we have other ways of working with clients. So an important question is how did you start your phone system? Were you a single business owner uh, like me? I started by myself and I started with my cell phone. I, I didn't need anything else because it was just me. Are you getting one or two lines from your local phone provider, whether that's Charter or Comcast or CenturyLink? That would be for us locally. There's other phone providers in other parts of the country. AT&T, uh, other countries would have Bell Rogers, you know, if you're in Canada. So did you get a single phone line from, from them? Are you plugging up a basic phone you got for a hundred bucks at Walmart? And is that going to be your phone system? And who is going to need a phone? Who has a cell phone? If you are going from yourself to other employees, you need to probably be able to have them make phone calls and make phone calls as the company. So one of the reasons that uh, we have high demand for a voice over IP is we can make the outbound calls say whatever you want them to say. And we can apply across the board. Every employee is calling from the main number and that's it. Uh, that becomes harder. Actually, that becomes impossible if, if, if you give all your employees a cell phone because now everyone has an individual number that clients or vendors or customers or whoever needs to contact people are, you know, are able to bypass your call routing system. So one of, the, one of the benefits of having some centralized phone systems, you have control over who's calling. Uh, if you've got, if you're like us and we, we do support, if um, I give out my, my cell phone to somebody, then they're going to call me directly. They might, you know, we might transition to having a full, you know, someone there full time answering the phone and we want to be able to route phone calls. And, you know, if you're calling for support, you need to talk to these people. If you're calling for accounting, you need to talk to these people. If you're calling for sales, you need to talk to these people. You bypass all of that if someone has a cell phone. And so that, that means that you as a company lose control over those inbound calls. So it's important to know who has cell phones and how are clients going to be able to reach you. So when you've got a centralized phone system, you can, you can manage that, you can track it, you can get call logs and, um, and as, as there's, better, there's better options for the company itself. So as your company grows, you should consider, can your phones ring in multiple locations? If you're one company, you've got 100 people in a single building, this might not matter so much, but we've got clients that have multiple locations. We've got one client that has, I don't know, 60 employees and they've got five locations. We transition them from individual phone systems at individual sites to a centralized voice over IP. And so now instead of having to dial the full phone number every time they want to call another office, everyone's on a three digit extension. They can all just dial each other and hit the three digit extension. And it's, it simplifies things immensely. They added a new location instead of arranging for new phone numbers. And now everyone's got to remember a new phone number. We just said, we just need three more extensions and boom, they're done. And it's, it makes it considerably easier for them to grow because now all that doesn't matter what site they're in, all their phones are in one location for the admin to manage. You can easily make changes as to who has access to that phone from one location. And you're not worried about You've got a Samsung in this location. You've got a charter phone connection in this location. You've got the Walmart AT&T special in this location. And they, I mean, they've done combinations of everything. Instead of having four different phone systems with four different sets of hardware, you've got the same phone in every location. And that, that has helped their growth significantly. Do you want or need a strict start and time, a strict start and stop time? So 
it's not uncommon for someone in the medical to need 24 hour support without having someone there 24 hours. So you will have a uh, answering service. And so do you need between the hours of nine and five for a phone call to go to your office, but then after five and before nine, someone else picks up. That's very easy to do. Just program an auto attendant, give it a start time, stop time, and say that if you're calling outside these hours, it, it goes to a answering service. Uh, that doesn't mean you need a, a, a hosted VoIP for that to happen. You can easily do that with an on-site phone system, but you need a, a decent phone system that will support an auto attendant for that to happen. That is actually a pretty common need uh, for, for people that have to do that 24 hour, hour support. Then you have other options that if they call outside of hours, you have a separate recording that says you've reached us out after hours, please leave a message. And you have once again, more control over what happens during those calls instead of it just ringing, 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 and then go to voicemail. That looks a bit more professional if you have the ability to control that. Can you access your phone system outside of the office? Once again, this has been huge with COVID and the fact that a lot of people are not necessarily going to their offices. So I was talking with a client three weeks ago and there was one person in the office. Normally there's like uh, about 10 people and I was, I was talking to them about their phones because I knew that they, they were going to be a good candidate for, for some of the features that I'm talking about. And so I asked, I asked the person there, so how, how are people checking the phones? Because I know you guys get a lot of phone calls, but no one's here in the office. And they basically have to dial, they had to dial into their phone system once a day and manually check their voicemails and see if anyone left them a voicemail. So that means they don't know if someone called and didn't leave them a voicemail and they don't know when they actually get their voicemails. So in our case, or what I'm, what I'm hoping to transition them to, they will get an email every time a voicemail is left and they'll have call logging that they can pull up at any time to be able to see missed calls as well as be able to get calls on their cell phones as a separate app or take a phone home and it just functions like it, it would in the office. That, is, that has been features that, that people have loved, especially with, with COVID being what it is. Then very importantly, does everyone need a phone? Or will there be personnel that won't need a phone? Uh, for example, we've got a client that has, call it 40 employees, but they only need eight phones. And the reason is because most of the people are on the factory floor making product. And when they're on the factory floor working at their station, they, they don't need a phone. It's only the administrative staff that need the phones. And so that's an important thing to know as you grow, especially uh, depending on the type of business. Uh, for a business like us, everyone has a phone. We absolutely have to have a phone because we live on our phones. We eat, sleep, and breathe our phones because that's how we do our support and that's how we generate our revenue. But there's plenty of companies here locally where someone is working, they're a full-time employee, but they don't need a phone for their phone system for the company. And that's extremely important to know in advance and be able to plan that out. And then, of course, do you give your cell phone up to clients or do you want to keep that private? Uh, something like a, a voice over IP, you can have a separate app. It rings as the company phone number. You do not have to give out your cell phone. And we've had a number of clients that absolutely love that feature because now they can make all calls. It comes from the company caller ID, but they're not giving out their cell phone to people. And that gives them an extra layer of privacy for being able to stay in touch with people, even if they're outside the office. And then finally, are you communicating with texting? We do a lot of text messages. Um, I, on my last phone bill, I just spot checked it. And I think I sent about 2,500 text messages last month. That's a normal month. Uh, and that's, I, I probably text a little bit more than, than some of my other employees, but we're all thousands of messages a month per person. So a traditional phone system doesn't have the ability to text from the work number. Uh, that's been another feature of a, a host of voice over IP system that has been extremely popular and helping people with that transition. All right, let's talk about email. After phones, we see email as an expeditious communication platform. I live on email as well. I've got probably 60,000 emails in my inbox that just sort of sit there. I use Gmail, so it's the search is extremely good. I can find pretty much anything I, I want to or need to, even though they're all just sitting in my inbox. And um, an important thing to consider 
is especially if you're a really small business, you want to save as much money as you can. And so we'll see people start with a Gmail uh, email address or a Yahoo or a live.com. Please don't use an AOL for your business. We see it around here more regularly than other parts of the country. It just looks bad. So the, the upside to using something like this is that these are all free. You're not paying anything. And when you're starting up a new business, especially you're trying to save every penny you can. And so not paying for email is a pretty nice thing to do. And even around here locally, we still see plenty of people, even established businesses that are using a Gmail or a charter or a Comcast email address. Um, that works more around here. I've, I've lived in other parts of the country where that was very much less acceptable. And if you didn't have a personalized domain name, you were not going to be taken seriously. Uh, but typically what will happen is these are not great for growth. So if you've got a single Gmail account, that does not scale. I, I have one client which uses a single Gmail account and it's checked by basically 10 people in the office. And I, I guess they make that work. I don't think I'd make that work because, you know, as a business owner, I'm emailing things that are not necessarily things I want other employees to be able to see. Uh, and that's just part of the nature of the position I'm in. And so when you're using a Gmail or Yahoo, you have to sign up for each individual account and there's no centralized management. You have no control over how people are using it and you have no visibility. So these just do not, these do not work for growth. And we're talking, you know, someone who's starting with one or two people. So a personalized domain, using your own domain name is what I would consider a, a bottom, you know, it's, it's a baseline. It should happen, period. And so the question is, how are you going to be able to host your own domain? And how are you going to be able to keep track of what employees are doing? And how do you make sure that information is not leaked by email? So as your company grows, when it comes to email, you should consider, are you going to host your email yourself? Are you going to have an external vendor host the email? Uh, we hardly see any on-premise email servers these days. There was a, a period of time when we were installing them basically every month. Uh, but because of Gmail, because of Office 365, uh, I, I can't think of the last time I worked on an on-premise email system. This was uh, primarily because the hosting options were terrible. Microsoft has done actually a pretty good job of getting a working platform. Their initial release of the um, of Office 365 was absolutely atrocious and it, it, it was just a disaster. And so it took several generations of Office 365 before it became something that we felt comfortable putting clients on. And nowadays, almost all of our clients have someone else host their email. Like that's just, that's just how things go. It's extremely rare to see someone using on-premise email. So even, even the government, federal government uses, I don't know, they switch back and forth between Gmail and Office 365, depending on who's got the better contract. And uh, it's, even at the largest organizations, it's extremely rare to see them hosting something internally. So basically you've got Office 365 and Gmail. Their base platforms are about the same. It's about $5 a month per mailbox if all you need is a basic email system. Uh, of course it goes up from there and they've got all sorts of features and uh, add-ons that you can pay for on top of that. They, it is almost assumed that you use your own domain name um, as you grow, but you know the hosting tier needs assessment. There are certain permissions and security models that you can implement with the higher paid tiers that you can't on the most basic tier. That being said, most of our clients, they just need the $5 a month plan and that's it. We do have clients that need to send secure email. And so we have to pay for a higher tier to be able to properly encrypt emails using Office 365. Our personal preference is Office 365 over Gmail, primarily because we can call up Office 365 and get support. Gmail has no support even for paying customers and that, that has that has come back to hurt at least one client very badly. So let's talk about line of business applications. So line of business or law, those needs tend to be generally industry specific. So for example, if you're in engineering or some even, even something that just needs to look at plans, AutoCAD is basically the big name on that market if you're looking at um, designs. 
you've got Morningstar, which is a big financial package. Um, locally, we, we support both EagleSoft and Dentrix for our dental clients. They, once again, they, they have a very specific task for a very specific industry. They don't really carry over. Um, I guess you could be using AutoCAD to design teeth, but that would be an extremely inefficient way and, and just, it would not work very well. But it's great for if you're an architect or if you're an engineering firm, you need to be swapping plans back and forth. We've actually had a landscaping company that will use AutoCAD for drafting out design for, for lawns, for example. Uh, you have, um, on the other hand, you do have common software packages that overlap. So for example, QuickBooks, that's probably the number three piece of software that we support after Microsoft Windows and Microsoft Office. Everyone uses QuickBooks. There's hardly any competition. Peachtree tries to be competition. It's, it's atrocious. Um, so it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you're, you can use QuickBooks. Microsoft Office, almost everyone has Word, Excel. It, it's, not a, it's not a question of what Office platform you're going to use. Is, do you need it for this computer or not? It's, there are competitors to Office, LibreOffice, OpenOffice. They've just never really made any market penetration on the business side because it doesn't work very well moving files back and forth between the platforms. So almost everybody uses Microsoft Office. You've got Adobe for PDF. PDFs are extremely ubiquitous. They can be opened on um, mobile devices, tablets, computers, and Adobe is the big name on that. There are other competitors, Primo PDF, but for the most part, Adobe is really the, the 800 pound gorilla on, in that industry. So let's talk about as your company grows, you should consider, do you need a server for your software or is it hosted offsite? Our most common scenario, for example, with QuickBooks is we're going to pick a computer. It's going to be the server for QuickBooks database file, and we'll have everyone connect to that. So whether that means you need two people in there at the same time, or you need 30 people in there at the same time, something is going to be acting as a server for that QuickBooks file. Uh, the other option is maybe you have your software hosted offsite. We have a company that, or we have a client that they recently moved their their core software from running on a server on their network to hosted by the vendor. The vendors like doing that because now they've got a monthly charge built into the subscription fee. They get access to the data. They've got better for marketing. And, uh, you know, like it's just, it, it, it's great for the vendor. The upside for the end user is now you're paying a fixed monthly fee. You don't have to worry about maintenance. You don't have to worry about hardware. You don't have to worry about updates. And so, the trade-off is that you're you're paying probably more than you would if you had it on site, but now your costs are fixed. You don't have, oops, our server died, and now we have to go spend X amount of dollars to get a replacement, or the hard drive died, or the backups failed, or something along those lines. It's, it's it reduces the concern for maintenance and worry on the end of the user. And so we have we have things that we host ourselves, we have things that are hosted off-site, which is sort of mix and match depending on what works best for us. And the same thing for, for, for your company as you grow. Um, vendors like hosting it recurring. It also does make it harder to switch to a vendor because they have all your data. I mean, that's, that's why vendors like it. it. It's better vendor lock-in. And then an important part, which I hate that I have to say this, but we encounter this all the time around here. Desktop computers do not make good servers, please dedicated servers running server hardware with server levels of hardware and server operating system are much better servers. There's just technical reasons why Microsoft wants you to buy the server version and not use a desktop for it. We do get requests all the time to use desktops as servers. And I mean, I guess we'll set it up for you, but you're going to have lots of problems. And then another important thing, do multiple users need to be able to access the software at the same time? such as multiple simultaneous users in QuickBooks. This is once again, the line of business. So uh, something like our, our dental clients, you've got the front staff that are using the software. You've got all the hygienists that are using the software. You've got the doctor in his office using the software. Everyone's in the software at the same time. So you need to make sure that you have good, a network that will support it. You have uh, hardware that will support it and you want to make sure everything's running smoothly. And then do you have, have you assessed permissions in that software? So something like QuickBooks, 
you have the ability to create a user and then deny them access to certain parts of QuickBooks. Uh, you have the ability for someone who can only go in and do invoicing or someone who can only go in and manage expenses. You have that ability within QuickBooks. You have that ability with uh, files on the server and, and another, uh, you know, many other applications will be able to do that. So as you grow, it's important to know who has access to what and does that access match the job description that they're doing? Because if you go from 20 people to 60 people, you might need a different permission structure. You go from 20 people to 200 people, you can almost guarantee you you're going to need a different permission structure. And the jobs that people are doing at 20 is not going to match the jobs that people are doing at 200. All right. Some other considerations you should also consider. How are you buying and licensing that software? Did you find out on eBay and hope it was legitimate? I wish I could say that's a joke, but it's not. We've had people just buy random licenses from sketchy websites in China and then and then wonder why it didn't work so well or wonder why it didn't activate or wonder why it couldn't work and, and wasn't licensed properly. We, we, we get those kind of questions. So it is important to know where you're getting your software. It's important to know that you're buying legitimate licenses. Um, without getting into the philosophical question of licensing software, it, most companies do require some sort of license and registration. They want to make sure that they're getting paid for the software that you're using. And so it's an important question of how, how it's being done. Micro, companies like Microsoft all offer volume licenses where you pay a certain amount per year and you have access to those licenses. Uh, are you buying a retail copy? So instead of paying Microsoft you know, X amount of dollars every year, did you just go and buy it once and now you've got that copy? There are trade-offs to both. The retail copy, you buy it once and that's it, and you're forever locked into that copy. So you go and buy a copy of Office 2019. Well, that's the only copy you're ever going to get. You're never going to get any upgrades. Whereas if you have a volume license, Microsoft releases the next version of Office, they'll just give it to you as part of your volume license. And now, now you're able to easily upgrade your system and stay current. But once again, you're paying more for it as you do that. It also does make it easier to centralize costs, whereas if everyone's going on Amazon and buying a retail copy of Office, it could be here, it could be there. You've got three licenses over here, three licenses over there. Instead of, we purchased one set of volume licenses and that's all we're using. So once again, there's trade-offs to both. Are you doing a subscription model? Vendors love this. Once again, it's that reoccurring revenue. They get information about that. Uh, they, they just love the subscription model. I've got clients that like it because once again, now they're paying a fixed amount every month. They don't have to think about which, which license goes to this, which license goes to that. They just pay for it and they pay, they pay more for the convenience of not having to worry about things. And then are you tracking your license usage? Do you have some sort of inventory that lets you know that you've got Microsoft Office installed on these 30 computers, but not these 10 computers? You've got Adobe Pro um, on these five computers. You've got Adobe Standard on these three computers. And the renewal date for that is you know in March. Do you know how many copies are in use? And it's easy to miss as you're growing. If you're just you know, buying computers left and right, you might not know that this new computer for sales has this license attached to it. Or even worse, and I've seen this happen too, people will bring in software from home and just install whatever software they want on business computers. And that can cause its own set of problems as well. And then at least... Uh, Software like QuickBooks and AutoCAD, I mean, they're, they're licensed and they're checking that license every time you open the program. So they're, it's pretty hard to violate that license. It's much easier to do with Microsoft Office or Microsoft Windows or some other, there's other software it's where it's much easier to uh, violate the, that license and that count. Let's talk about hardware management. Uh, companies will frequently start with whatever equipment the owner already has. I know when I started my company, um, I was working off a laptop that I had. It was my personal laptop that I took and I started taking calls on it and using it for work email. And that's, that's a pretty common scenario. This can be old systems. This could be slow systems. This could be unsecure systems or worse comes to worse. These could be broken systems. We've seen it all. It is what it is. You're trying to start, you know, if you're in a startup, you're trying to use whatever you have available to minimize costs. And that doesn't always mean uh, good computers or good systems. Um, Unfortunately, we frequently have to buy, I explain why um, the computer from Best Buy or Walmart is not really a business class. We prefer, you know, we have vendors that we prefer for networking equipment. We have vendors that we prefer for hardware, for computers, for servers. 
and there's reasons we prefer them. They're designed for business class use. They're divine, you know, designed for enterprise use. They're designed to be running 24 seven. I hate it every time, you know, I got to go to Best Buy and grab a, a router for somebody because that Wi-Fi is going to break in a year. That's just how it goes. The low end models, the Wi-Fi dies out pretty quickly or it can't keep up or, you know, any number of reasons. As you grow, if you're a 100, 100, 200 person company, this is, there's typically less of a reason, you know, I don't, I don't have to explain why Best Buy is not a great option for companies of that size. But when you're, when you're growing and you're smaller, it's really tempting to go and buy whatever is the best discount and the cheapest price just to keep things down. You also have issues managing age of systems and hardwares. So um, like right now we can, as, as right now when, when Microsoft was killing off Windows 7 and trying to transition everyone to Windows 10, we were able to pull a report of across all of our clients and say, hey, we have these computers that are still running Windows 7. We need to go to these individual people and talk to them about upgrades. Uh, after that, we can look at, here's all the systems that are running Windows 10 that don't have solid state drives because we know that they're going to have performance issues. They're still on mechanical drives. So we can run that report and then we can go to those clients and say, here's, this, our, here's the concern that we have. Here's what we'd like to do. And here's how we'd like to help you upgrade. That's great for us. We're an IT company. Uh, we manage that. And that's, that's part of our core system. If you're not having that as part of your core system, you need to have something in place to be able to know what you know, so be able to know what you have and how old it is and when can you expect it to need upgrading and what are the hardware requirements for your systems that are in place. So that is, especially as you're growing, you're just throwing equipment left and right at positions. That becomes a, a much bigger problem. Hardware management. As you grow, you should consider, do you have a standardized approach to buying desktops, laptops, servers, and networking equipment? Are you allowing people to bring stuff from home? Are you giving someone... A, you know, a gift card to Walmart and asking them to go buy whatever they have in stock? Are you just going on Amazon and buying the first random thing that you see? Uh, so having a standardized approach to buying equipment will help you manage your growth and it will help you know what you need and when you're going to need it and how you're going to need it. So we have a standardized approach for our clients and probably 95% of the time clients are buying the same thing. So we order the same thing almost all the time. When you start talking servers, when you start talking um, higher end computers or networking equipment, then yes, we have to go in and customize and figure out you know, specific needs for that individual. Uh, but we save ourselves a ton of time because we have a standardized approach. And when someone needs a desktop, I can tell you the price, I can tell you the specs because it's the same thing every time. And that's, that's, uh, that's how we do it for our business customers. Uh, all systems we sell come with a three-year warranty, which we hardly ever have to use, thankfully which is part of the reason why we use the business class computers. Uh, but if you end up with a motherboard failure a year in, that's the most expensive part to replace. And it's also pretty time consuming if you decide to do it yourself. Um, you know, with a three-year warranty, it's all covered, they'll repair it and, and you're good to go. And you know, just have some downtime. Do you have a standard age for keeping equipment in production or is it just gonna be run it till it dies? Uh, that attitude is something we see regularly it's rare to have a client that says, oh, this computer's five years old, it's automatically upgrading. Because the idea is if it's working fine, why would you wanna upgrade it? Our general rule of thumb is if it's under three years, we'll recommend replacing it. If it's three to four years old, anywhere actually more like a three to five year old, we'll go either way. It depends on what part failed, it depends on why it failed. It depends on if we think that there's other issues with the system. But if it's in the three to five year range, we'll probably recommend fixing it, even if it's out of warranty. If it's over five years and it suffers failure, I'm probably gonna recommend upgrading just because at that point, you've got other parts of the system that are five years old and they're really not designed to run that long. I mean, they will. We've got clients that have computers that are seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old even, and they work fine. I've got a client with a server that's 12 years old it runs, it doesn't run very well. Uh, I'm scared to death that it's gonna die, but it runs. And so if, it, you know, if it's working, why replace it? Well, the, my attitude is, why don't you replace it while it's working instead of waiting for it to become a disaster and having to deal with a last minute emergency. So that is, as you grow, that is something to consider and determine. 
And then if you come up with a policy that says, hey, every desktop that's four years old or five years old gets automatically replaced, you're going to have a lot less emergencies and you're going to have a lot less problems on average. If you decide, hey, we're going to be able to keep our computers for six, seven years and we don't have an issue with that. Well, yeah, you'll be spending, you'll have longer periods of time between paying for upgrades. But those last couple of years, your maintenance costs are going to go up and the amount of time that those systems need to keep running and the time people spend on us, it's, it, it tends to be more expensive than just replace it. So once again, we go either way and we'll, we'll typically, you know, recommend preemptive upgrades, but it's not always, it's, it's on a, it's on a case by case basis. Hardware management, as your company grows, you should also consider hardware age is easy to forget in times of growth. That's why I love my ability to run a report and say, all these computers are this age. Let's, let's go approach these clients about upgrading them. Uh, it's something that's extremely important, especially if you're in long periods of growth. If you're booming for five years straight, you probably have really old equipment that could probably need to be upgraded. And typically you won't notice underperforming systems until they break. That's another big issue that people don't necessarily consider. Um, if you've got a slow computer and it takes 10 minutes to boot up, well, that's 10 minutes that that employee just lost because they're waiting for their computer to start. It's also probably gonna be freezing at random points throughout the day. There's, a, there's, there's gonna be significant periods of downtime attributed to the computer being slow. Whereas if you just replaced it or put in a solid state or put in a fresh reinstall of windows or something along those lines, you're now saving your employee considerable amounts of productivity throughout the day. But if it's not broken and it's just underperforming, that tends to get noticed far less. Asset management is key, uh, especially when it comes to knowing how long systems can be kept in production. So that's something that we have for our clients, there's all sorts of solutions to asset management. Uh, you got to find something that works for you. Software management. For software, this could be computer operating systems. This could be a lot of business software, even free utilities installed on a regular basis. Um, typically, you will have software that will have a certain lifespan. QuickBooks is notoriously bad for this. They will support only the past three years. So right now, QuickBooks 2021 is out. That means only 2021, 2019, and 2020 are currently getting support and will allow you to do credit card processing and download your bank statements. If you have 2018, too bad. You have to upgrade if you want those features. So they're ensuring a purchase at least every three years um, if you want to use those features. If you don't want to use those features, then you're fine. You can keep using older copies. But this, uh, this can be... There are other vendors that do the same thing whether it means that it no longer supports Windows 7, which is actually something we've been encountering more and more lately. Uh, Microsoft discontinued Windows 7. We still have clients with Windows 7. We're at the point where newer versions of software are running either badly on Windows 7 or Windows 7 is just no longer supported. So that's something that will, that software, that software management becomes important on helping people keep track of what's deployed. Um, you've got upgrades that stop working. You've got systems to stop receiving support. Microsoft does a 10-year basis. So Windows 7 came out in, I want to say, 2009. They were going to sunset it earlier than 2019. Now, 2019 is when they sunset it. So you could pay for extended support through 2022, I believe, if you're, um, if you're a high-dollar, high high-value system that that needs to have running windows 7 for some particular reason you can pay for extended support i don't have any clients that need that those are big government or big big agencies big governments big big companies that they can't upgrade past windows 7 for some reason but that's just microsoft they are you know since most people use them it's pretty important to know that uh, software management continue as your company grows you should consider how are you managing your licenses how many copies of office do you have do you know who's got what copy installed? If you've got 30 copies uh, that you paid for retail, do you know when they were purchased? Do you know where they were registered? Because you have to register a copy of Office if you buy it retail. And you're going to have a problem if you don't know where that's registered. Do you have the ability to know if it's been updated? I mean, there's all these questions that having a basic asset management system helps you solve. And how are you paying for those licenses? How often are you paying for those licenses? Is there a less expensive way to manage those licenses? Uh, for example, for nonprofits, 
you can get a number of these things for free. Uh, TechSoup is a great resource. They give massive discounts for nonprofits. I, I cry every time I look at their pricing because I have to pay full retail myself. And you know what they're what the nonprofit is getting for forty dollars, I pay four hundred dollars for. So that you know that's great for the nonprofits, and a, a little part of me dies inside every time I I see that price. So how are you paying for those licenses? Uh, do you have a company card, or do you have a do you have a standardized approach to buying buying software? Or is some random employee buying it on their card and getting reimbursement? I mean, these are all things that need to be considered. And especially if you're growing, you know, maybe the way that you're purchasing software when you had 10 employees won't work very well when you've got 50 employees. Maybe you need to have a single purchasing person who's responsible for tracking all that. Uh, you know, for example, you've got a retail copy of Office being about 220 If you go on Amazon, it's more if you go to Microsoft.com. You could get a monthly subscription for about eight twenty five dollars on Office 365. Uh, those numbers bypass each other in that you're going to be paying more for a retail copy in the short run, but the monthly subscription of Office on 365 is going to cost you considerably more after about two years. Less than that, but you know, two years and you're paying considerably more. Some people like that. I personally don't. But how are you going to manage it? Maybe it's easier to pay that monthly fee than it is to buy 20 copies of retail and then now you've got all these keys you have to juggle. And then are you paying for licenses you no longer need? That's another important thing. If you, if you don't have anything to manage how you're buying your software, it's entirely possible that you've paid for 50 copies of the software and you've only got 30 installed or you only need 25 and now you're spending all this extra money. It, this, is a, this is a very common problem with companies that are growing fast and they don't know what they're spending and how they're spending it. Uh, so having some sort of management, centralized management gives you visibility into allocation of licenses as well as the cost of those licenses. All right, so a couple important things. What you do for IT with only a couple computers will not work with 20 computers. What you do for 20 computers will not work with 100 computers. And wait, uh, you know, essentially the bigger you get, the more involved, the more time you're going to spend on managing it unless you set good standards and patterns early on. Uh, you need to, that means keeping track of utilization. That means keeping track that you have enough systems. That means you have enough licenses. That means you have enough hardware. Uh, all these things need to be uh, tracked if you want to have the best possible growth. Uh, same thing with licenses and hardware age as if you've got old computers deployed and something critically fails, that's going to be a problem for you. And then finally, permissions. You don't want people to have more permissions than they need. And especially as you grow, you're going to have staff roles change. You might have one person that's doing 30 things when you've got 10 people. And now that you're at 50 people, those roles might be broken out and they no longer need access to those systems. So that's, uh, that's the core of the presentation. So I'm, I'm ready for questions. Great. Great, Jonathan. Thank you so much for the information. Um, I'll just go ahead and say up front, I'm one of those that used to try to take the cheap way out, even at work. And I no longer do that. I promise our contract IT person, I don't touch it. I call him first because there have been issues along the way that have been created. So uh, that's my encouragement is to, to everyone is to take a look at that. But let's go ahead and get into some of our questions. Um, so I, I did have uh, someone, Michael, he had asked about the recording. I did let him know that we'll be sending this recording out. I think that's right, Sandy. We'll, we'll email it out following the presentation. Yes, and, jo and Jonathan, can you take off uh, slide sharing? Yes. All right. So you'll send that uh, recording as well as Jonathan's contact information. But um, Michael also, he, he wants to know if you work with like small one-man realtor, he oh, yeah. serves her sales. Hey, I don't absolutely. even have to finish that, Michael. So um, yeah, what I would encourage you to do is reach out to Jonathan following this. His contact information will be provided to you. Okay. Um, one that he also did have a specific question that a lot of his clients come from LinkedIn. So, you know, in a lot of business, I think leads come from a social platform, not necessarily the telephone. Do you have any tips for interacting with software, phone systems in that aspect? Yeah, I'm, I have, I'm not familiar with phone systems that directly integrate with LinkedIn, but I've also never really looked. I've, I've, 
I know uh, one of our clients picked a particular phone vendor because they interacted or integrated with Salesforce, for example. And so, you know, he's got, he's got that sales platform such that when they call up the phone calls dumped into Salesforce along with the emails are dumped into Salesforce. And so he can look at, you know, pick any one of his clients and he can look at all customer interactions as they've occurred across all of the staff. So it's great when it integrates, but I have, I am not familiar personally with systems that integrate with LinkedIn. That doesn't mean they don't exist. It means no one's asked me and I've never looked at it before, but that'd be reasonably easy to check and see if there are integrations. Okay. All right. So I'd be surprised that I'd be surprised if there's not. I would probably agree with that. So, um, I'm sorry, I had an open question. I thought that I did not see, but we'll go back in. All right, so I'm going to uh, start from the bottom of what we've got. So what are the pros and cons of having a cloud-based system? Um, and does your company do cloud hosting? So the pros are that you no longer are buying your hardware to maintain. You don't have a physical server that could crash. You don't have to worry about backups. Hopefully you're you're sort of trusting your cloud vendor that they're managing the backups, they're managing the patches, they're managing security, they're managing all these things and you're not paying somebody to manage this for you. So in that particular case, you've now got typically a, a fixed fee or you've got, you're, you're able to anticipate your costs and you're evening out your cost, uh, your, your required costs. As opposed to you buy a server, well, now you've got your layout for the server, and then you might not have anything for a couple months, and then all of a sudden, you've got some critical failure, and now you're paying your IT guy to come in and fix your server, and now your, your, your costs are bouncing up and down depending on what's happening in that month. So that's the pro. The con is that now your data is on their server, and you don't own your data. Whoever physically has the data is the one who owns the data. They might tell you it's your data, but it's their data and they're letting you access their data. So you also have no idea if they're reading your information. Um, you know, Gmail, they index everything. They use it for search. They use it for marketing. They use all sorts of analysis. And so you just have no idea what they're doing with your data. All right. Thank you. Um, at what point should a startup business begin having the discussion about their technology needs? So um, basically what we're asking is, you know, we've got a startup. How long would it take to get your hardware and software ordered and set up and that type of thing? Depends on what you need. I mean, computers are pretty easy to get. Laptops are less easy to get. Printers are virtually impossible to find, for example. Um, I was in Best Buy yesterday trying to find a printer for a client and they had three things that I could pick from because there's just been no supply. And the last time I was in there trying to find a printer for them, they had two printers that I could pick from. Now, is that just a current supply issue or is that- yeah, it's been bad since COVID. Issue? It's been bad since COVID started. Okay, all right. Yeah, so, so. so desktops were okay with, servers were okay with, laptops are nigh impossible to find in printers. I've heard of those mythical entities. <laughs> okay. So in, in other words, start including that early in your business plan is what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Order it before some of those things, you're better off ordering it before you need it. Um, and, and part of it depends on your own, how much growth are you anticipating? How much growth are you seeing? So if you buy, you know, a $50 inkjet printer, that might be okay for a period of time. But if you're planning on adding five people next week, it's not going to work. You're, you're, that, that's just not going to work. So especially in a startup, that requires um, some educated guesswork. It requires some some magic. You know, there's there's sort of a combination between this. It's some some art, some science when it comes to anticipating growth in a startup. And so, Jonathan, that can also include your printer cartridges and so forth, because yeah. I've had uh, oh, some. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's that that can be uh, months out before you can even get supply. So you better have something yeah. in stock. So, and, 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 you know, if you're in a situation where, you know, it's going to be five people working on a startup and you need a year to be able to write the software. Well, okay. Now, you know, that it's going to be a year before you really need to be investing in, in heavy infrastructure. If you have a hobby that you've been working out of your garage and all of a sudden it's taken off and now you need four people this week, you need four more people next week, you need four more people after that. 
then it's, it's going to be to your advantage to start doing some planning as soon as possible. Okay. Oh, and then I realized that I missed a, we do, we, we do some cloud hosting for a client. I don't necessarily advertise that we do that. I typically will manage that. And then we uh, absolutely do free analysis and consultations. Okay. Great. Yeah. I was going to make sure we put that in <laughs> as well. So, all right. Uh, another question is we have a, um, if I have a website, and my host site offers email hosting. Is that the normal for the industry? And I see yes. you grimacing a little bit. Oh, yeah, so, you get this question a lot. Oh, they're going to give me email and it's not going to cost me very much. Well, there's a reason it's not going to cost you very much because it's probably pretty bad. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. Yeah, we. I mean, you know, you've got GoDaddy that offers email. You've got Bluehost that offers email. You've got, you know, all these different websites that offer you email and... I mean, they work for a small level. They don't scale very well. People don't, they don't sync you. Your contacts and your calendars don't sync. That's why you pay for exchange. That's why you pay for Gmail. There's, it's missing all these enterprise features that you just don't, you don't get when you're using your web hosts email platform. In addition to it, it's probably pretty bad from spam filtering and there's probably no security. I say that mostly not, not because I, I, you know, that's not going to be the case across the board. It's a consistent thing that we find with people that try to use their web host for email. Okay. And, and there's a reason we recommend Office 365 and Gmail as a business platform. Got it. Got it. So instead of saying, hey, let's use, I, I set up my website through Get, GoDaddy and I'm going to utilize their branded email that they're offering me. It's no, never good. Set it up separately. And with, you know, your business name at the end and, and hosting an aspect, is that a yeah. better way? Is that a good way to say that? Yeah. And they're great for website hosting. We've got plenty of clients that host with GoDaddy. Um, their domains, I use them for, for a decade and a half for SSL certificates. Like there's stuff that they do that's great. And we use them internally for those specific things. They're also really bad at a couple of things. And I, you know, try to avoid that entirely. And that's why we recommend a, a more full-fledged actually GoDaddy is in the process of getting rid of their email hosting and switching all their clients to office 365. Okay. So they're getting out of it in part because it's not very good. Okay. So um, you kind of mentioned that, that it maybe does also does not have a lot of um, uh, protection against maybe spam and things like that. So I guess, are you saying you need to look out for protecting employee emails or, or, or yep. is there anything that you should look out for protecting employee emails? So um, multi-factor authentication, we see problems with people having their email accounts hacked and now they're sending emails as, as an employee. Uh, we've had a situation where the owner of the company had his email account compromised and the person sent a wire request to the head of accounting that requested a very large amount of money to go out by wire to pay a bill. Okay. So that's not fiction that, that really happened. So <laughs> multi-factor authentication would have fixed that real quick because he would have gotten a prompt saying, Oh, we saw that you logged in. Here's right. your verification text message. And he would have been like, wait, what? I didn't log in, you know? Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty important thing. Then there's other, other industries like financial and medical. They will have requirements for content security on email, like the ability to see if you're emailing social security numbers or the ability to email, like the ability to check the contents of your email to make sure that you're complying with the various restrictions. So your basic website host, GoDaddy is not going to have that functionality. If you need higher level email security that scans for number patterns that match social security numbers, you're going to need to pay for the higher tier of Office 365 to get that enterprise level. Yes. Okay. So um, I know we're approaching the hour. We have just a few more questions, if that's okay. Uh, we would like to say for a small business uh, or for a very small business, do you have the top four to six things or products or services that they should invest in now? Us. <laughs> and <laughs> No, um, basically, uh, and I see actually a question about QuickBooks. So QuickBooks has been, um, like I said, it's an, it's the number three that we support after Microsoft Office and Microsoft Windows. And that's a, that's a getting familiar with QuickBooks. We see people that have messed up their, their books pretty badly. They don't set up their, their chart of accounts well. They don't know how their 
their expenses are working, which means that all the reports are off and they don't know how to plan for growth and manage their cash and all that. So, so getting a good copy of QuickBooks is extremely important. Whether you do it online or desktop, I prefer desktop. There's one of the questions in there is desktop versus cloud. I don't like QuickBooks cloud. That's a very biased opinion because I've been involved with QuickBooks for 20 years. So I have a certain way of how I like things to look and the cloud looks very different and it functions very different and they moved all sorts of stuff around. It's also very expensive compared to desktop. Like the price is astronomical compared to desktop. So once again, vendor lock-in, you don't know what they're doing. So being able to plan and manage your hardware, being able to plan and manage your software, even a basic inventory system, whether asset tracking or inventory is going to be extremely helpful for managing. Even, even if it's even if it's an Excel spreadsheet that lists all your computers, their serial numbers, and their purchase dates. That's a gr- that's that's better than probably 80% of our clients. Like they don't even have that. I mean, they're they're depending on us to manage that for them. And they pay us for that. And we have those reports and we can pull that information and I can easily look at it and say, okay, who are all the computers that have less than eight gigs of RAM? Because Windows 10 needs eight gigs of RAM. And I can pull that report and I click and boom, I've got that list. So it, that's if you're not using uh, an enterprise level system like that, even something as simple as Excel to be able to put in, okay, we've got these copies installed here. We've got this hardware here. This, this computer was purchased on this date. That will go a long way. Cause then you can say three years from now, when you've forgotten, when you purchased, you know, the desktop that's running your whole company. Uh, oh, this is a six year old computer. We probably need to look at upgrading it. And I knew you, you mentioned, and I think there's probably definitely two things to look at. You've got, really hardware asset management, you know, mm-hmm. things that are tangible. Then you have subscription or software management. Yep. And so do you have any tips for businesses and maybe how they should approach that? Um, I find especially because those cloud-based are auto renew and then, you know, it shows up on the credit card and it's like, Oh wait, we yep. <laughs> know that happened. So do you have any tips for that? Um, so it depends on the size, you know, a 200 employee company is going to have considerably different needs. And that's where Microsoft is going to come after them and say, Hey, here's our enterprise agreement. You pay us this amount of dollars every year and you have access to all these different licenses and we don't care how you use them. You're just, you're, you're able to install this many computers and install this many copies of office and install this many copies of server and install this many copies of SQL server. You know, you, you, you can just get that enterprise agreement and, it makes it easier for the administrator because now you can, you can use that same license key as many times as you want. And you know that you're paying for it based on this amount of numbers, as long as you know that you've got that many installed. So, but that's, those are expensive. And once again, it's geared toward somebody who's got a couple hundred computers or they've got a hundred computers. And so uh, at at the smaller level uh, we've got clients that, they'll go in and they'll buy the subscription for office 365 and they like it because if they upgrade their computer, they just click on a link, they install office and boom, it's all there. They like that. And I look at the numbers and I go, yeah, but you're paying for that convenience and you're paying a whole lot more for that convenience. And that's just, that's their preference. So some of that is going to be preference and some of it's going to be, how do you want to spend your money? Uh, For us internally, I typically try to purchase things but I'm also in a position where I can support all the software we use. Like that's a huge difference too. Okay. Because, you know, not only do I use our internal software, I support it, I set it up and I make sure it works. Okay. So I'm in, I'm in a position where I can do that. So you're, you're able to support your own self through your yeah. own needs. That's right. that. Yeah. Okay. And so that's well, a huge difference for us. So it looks like, and you mentioned that, because like you said, a lot of times for that cloud, you get the support included or you pay for that support. Yep. However, you have the knowledge and background yep. that you don't necessarily need that. So if, you, yep. if you're a business that says, you know, I, need, I want to call somebody, that kind of goes back to the very first thing you said was a lot of times we like to pick up the phone and be able to get a hold of yep. someone instead of that help ticket. So yep. keep that in mind. Well, I know I want to be um, very respectful of everyone's time that has joined us. Uh, let me just back up. You mentioned it, uh, that I think you do kind of analysis and consultations. Mm-hmm. Do you um, charge fees for that or, or how, how do you That's go about? Typically your- we'll do a review for free. Okay. 
All yeah, right. We, so. we don't mind sitting down and going, going over systems with people and just assessing things. Okay. Uh, that's, that's usually not a big deal. I mean, if, if I, if I have to drive three hours to get there, then probably Maybe. we'll charge something, but you know, with, with zoom and FaceTime and any of the other number of ways that we can interact with clients and, and see what we need to, that's, you know, we'll, we'll usually give an hour or two for free and just give an assessment and see what, see what you need. Okay. Um, with that being said, how do you feel about interacting uh, zoom into your business and being, you know, I think that's the new model. And yeah, that. we zoom. I mean, zoom is how zoom is how I've been attending church for, you know, a year now. And zoom is how we've been doing our networking meetings for a year now. And, you know, it's almost death by zoom at this point. Very true. We, so we do a lot of zoom. Okay. Well, let me go ahead and um, wrap up Jonathan. And again, we will make sure that all the attendees do receive a recording as well as the, the presentation. So you will have Jonathan's contact company contact information. Um, again, thank you to everyone for attending this week. I do want to be sure to mention our next um, our next training in this series, which will be February 18th. And that's actually going to be online payment systems, point of sales, online reservation services. So for any businesses that are, you know, especially in this e-commerce world, and that's actually going to be, our speaker is going to be Chris Clear from Atlantic Merchant Services. Okay. He's, he's one of my clients, one of my vendors, and a very good friend. Yes. So thank you, Jonathan, for helping connect us with him. So um, let me, on behalf of Virginia Community Capital, the Virginia Small Business Development Center Network, and uh, UVA Wise, we are thankful that you were here today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll turn it over back over to Sandy Ratliff just to wrap us up. Well, Jonathan, I too want to say thank you. I know that you're taking time out of your busy schedule to develop the content and share your uh, knowledge today. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, Mandy, love, I love doing this. I'm, I appreciate the opportunity. And as Mandy mentioned, we'll be getting you out the links um, for you can um, see the session. Uh, it will also be on Virginia Community Capital's uh, Facebook and YouTube channels, as well as um, I'm sure our friends at the Small Business Development Centers will be putting it on there. So. Again, thank you. Uh, I hope you found value. Please share it with others and invite them to join you um, in the next session, especially next week. Uh, have a good day, everybody. Stay warm, stay safe, and hope to see you in two weeks. Excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.